So welcome everyone to today's June 11th Tales from the Deep Insights from Ocean Wise Research Program. We are so excited to be joined by Dr. Aroha Miller today to be telling us all about Healthy Oceans Beginning at Home, a Community Conservation Toolbox. And so we're excited to learn a little bit about our place-based learning and community and citizen science projects here in Vancouver, British Columbia. And it's so exciting to see that we have audience members joining us from so many different places in the world and that we hope that this can continue to start a great conversation about how we can work together in our communities as a community, no matter where we are. So it's one o'clock on the dot right now. Perfect. And I would like to welcome Aroha and Hopefully we'll see you on screen in just a moment with your video camera there. So to welcome all of our audience members, if you're just starting to get signed in, you might have heard me say this if you signed in a few minutes early, but for all of our audience members, the best way for you to connect with us today is by opening up your chat window and then connecting to the a uh, little blue speech bubble that will open your chat, setting your two messages to host and presenter. That way they'll all get sent to both myself, Danica, your online learning host today, and our guest, Dr. Aroha Miller, and we'll be able to respond to your comments throughout the program. If you do have questions, and we love questions in this program, then we encourage you to put those in the Q&A box just at the bottom, um, and you can open that up and make that accessible to you by just clicking the little arrow next to that. And at first, I'd like to start today's program off by seeing how grateful I am to be teaching and learning and living on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. They have been using observation and storytelling and scientific practices in this community since time immemorial. And OceanWise, in all that we do, both education and research, really strive to learn from and with our First Nations communities and build those practices into what we're doing on a daily basis. So thank you very much. And we're looking forward to a wonderful program. Um, so Aroha, it looks like maybe you're a little bit fuzzy on screen, but I hope that your audio is gonna come through nice and clear. So if you'd like to say, Hello to everyone. I'll just switch over the presenter capabilities so that we can see any slides that you might want to share with us today. Hi, everybody. Everyone hear me? I do have slightly funky internet, I have to admit. My husband's also on a video conferencing call at the moment and it drains our internet. So please let me know if. You can't hear me very well, and I may have to stop my video, but continue sharing my screen. So if, I, if you're starting to lose me, just give me some thumbs up signs or pop a message in the chat, okay? So I'm gonna begin sharing my screen with everybody. So first of all, thank you, Danica, for that lovely introduction. Um, my name's Aruha. I am from New Zealand originally, but I've been living in Vancouver for seven years now. And this little talk today is titled Healthy Oceans Begin at Home, a Community Conservation Toolbox. Um, and I'm going to acknowledge my two co-authors here, Jen Chapman and Amber Dearden, and together we make up the Ocean Watch team. I'm the manager of the Ocean Watch group, um, and we are based at the Vancouver Aquarium when we're not having a global pandemic. Um, so thanks everyone for joining me. Danica, you already said you were asking people to write in the chat box where they were joining us from. Um, that was something I was going to ask people to do as well, and I have to admit that right now I can't see the chat box, I've managed to muck that up, um, but it sounded like there were people from Germany and all across the world joining us, as well as all across Canada. So that's really helpful for me to know, because I often 
talk about this particular piece of work with people who are familiar with the area. So it's going to be really helpful to me. It's very helpful to me to know where everyone is so I can um, make sure I bring it up to a level where people who aren't familiar with the area know what I'm talking about. So maybe you've joined us today because you're interested in how to improve your local marine environment. Um, you might be concerned about the amount of pollution that goes into the ocean where you live, or there might be a big increase in the number of shipping vessels coming back and forth. You might have noticed a lot of offshore development and be wondering what sort of negative impacts that could be having and what can be done to reduce those negative impacts. Or maybe you're someone with a few more white hairs than I've got, and you might realise that over the years you're noticing less birds or less whales or, you know, less... Uh, less seals or something and you're concerned about that. So I'm going to tell you a story about this fantastic community group that I have had the pleasure and privilege of working with um, who collectively have thought about all of these things and a whole lot more and then along the way they have asked Ocean Watch to join them to help move forward. So, so far I'm going to give you a quick background on Ocean Watch. Um, like I said, there's three of us, well really there's two and a half of us, there's two full-time and one part-time there. And we produce these reports, um, these are just two of the reports we've done, and they talk about the health of the coastal ocean environment. So on the left-hand side here, this is the Ocean Watch Hell Sound Edition, which was produced in 2017. And this is the Ocean Watch BC Coast Edition, which was produced in 2018. So both of these reports, and in fact all of the work we do, um, we use non-technical language. I am trained as a scientist and I'm very, very aware that scientists like to use a lot of fancy jargon and they forget that other people maybe haven't trained in that area and it can take a lot of effort for someone who doesn't have that background training sometimes to understand what a scientist is really trying to say. Um, so my team and I work really hard to um, bring you information in a way that everyone can understand. They're aimed at sort of high school level learning so um, if you're at that level of high school, this should be understandable. We also include a lot of simplified graphics. Teachers like Danica and the edu education team, they particularly love. Um, and they can be used even at elementary school level. Um, they really break down complex scientific ideas and put them out there in a very easy to understand way. And they've been very, very popular with the people who pick up these reports. Something else that we always do in anything we produce is provide a list of recommended actions on what you can do to help improve. So these reports on their own, so I don't have any information box because they provide a lot of knowledge about anything from whales to seals fish to eelgrass, to different habitats, um, to the amount of vessel traffic, and a lot of the other things I mentioned before as well. They're great not only for education. The people we want to watch the answer to them, there's some makers and decision makers, some government and professional federal level government. And I don't know if any of you out there who are listening have ever worked at these government levels or Um, I'm just going to go for a moment because I see some um, difficulty hearing me. I think it's probably my internet. I just bear with me while I stop sharing, jump out, turn off my video, and come back in. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Aroha. And once you're screen sharing again, you can always reopen your chat box just at that little orange bar at the top so you can still see. Thank what you. Thanks, Danica. Okay, thank you. Yes, so hopefully that's better now. Um, there's not much else I can do. I can hear my husband talking in the other room. He's stealing my internet. Um, so we, yeah, if you want to make a change or improve the health of the environment, you need to know about it. And that's a really critical thing. And a lot of people, especially in government levels and things, they don't have time to go digging into scientific reports or speaking to scientists or wading through data. And that's been a really important place, niche for us to hop in and distill down that information to a level where it's really easy to pick up and read. And in fact, people have told me it's an enjoyable read, which is really fun to hear. Um, so we use knowledge collected by 
scientists. A lot of them work at OceanWise and the Research Institute. Um, we have worked very closely with the um, Ocean Biodiversity Research Team, which is headed up by Jessica Schultz. And the name of that team used to be the Hell Sound Research Team. Um, it's just had a name change, but they do the same things. Uh, we've also worked very closely with um, community members and citizen scientists, and of course, with First Nations members. So I'm going to focus today on this um, left-hand side one, the Ocean Watch Hell Sound edition, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've got a 2020 edition that's due for release in August, and I'm super excited about that. So I'm going to drop a lot of teases about what's coming up in the 2020 edition as I move forward today. Just a little bit of unabashed plugging of that there. Um, on top of that, the area, Hell Sound area, is a really um, specific geographic region, and there's very, very motivated, engaged communities and community members out there who have really picked up and run with what we've given them in these reports. So it's been very much um, a privilege and a pleasure to be doing this work. Um, so my first little teaser, is this working? No. Okay, I appear, there we go. This is the cover title, the cover page of the upcoming Ocean Watch 2020 edition. You can see it's a work in progress. There's some highlighting and comment bubbles on there for our graphic designer. But that's what the book is going to look like. Um, if you're not familiar with the Ocean Watch reports, they're not only physical hard copies, we also have online. So you can go to oceanwatch.ca and you will find all of this online. You can download individual articles or the entire report or the executive summary. And that will be the same moving forward. You'll be able to download all these things as well. So on to our next slide. This is how sound. Um, so Hell Sound or Al Katsum, um, which is the Squamish Nation name, there's two Squamish Nation names and I can't pronounce one of them and I think it's uh, very disrespectful of me to try and pronounce it if I can't do it properly. So Al Katsum, Hell Sound are the two names I'm going to use. This lies within the unceded territory of the Squamish Nation. So for people who aren't familiar with the area, Danica sort of put a bit of a reference point on it before. A, we're in Canada. B, we're on the west coast. On, um, in BC. The closest major city is Vancouver, which is just off the bottom corner of this map. If you're a ski buff or particularly into winter sports, you're probably familiar with Whistler. And this brown line here represents Highway 99, the Sea to Sky Highway, which takes you way up off the page to Whistler. But on that drive, you pass the sound. Now the sound, the other side of the sound, it, um, abuts the Sunshine Coast. And we're really, really lucky in this area and that it's full of recreational opportunities. Pretty much any sort of water sports you want to do, you can go ahead and do it there. There's hiking, mountain climbing, mountain biking, a whole bunch of winter sports. Um, something else you'll probably also notice as you look at this is that there's a lot of communities throughout the sound. There's also a lot of development going on because it's such a popular area and the population keeps growing. And as a population grows, you have to provide the amenities to support that population. So these communities have been working together for at least 20 years, probably more, as they figure out a way to move forward, continuing to grow in a sustainable way, but protecting the beautiful wildlife and nature that occurs in this area. So there's actually 10 governing bodies within this area and Squamish Nation. And I'm going to repeat myself on that a few times throughout this because that can be a very um, tricky thing to navigate if you're trying to get everyone to work together for a common goal. But the lucky thing with this area is that all of these groups have this common goal of wanting to protect this area. So that's made life a lot easier. So I want to run you through the, the structure of the report a little bit, because I know there's people listening who aren't familiar with it. Um, and I'm going to use the 2017 Hell Sound report as the example. So in the 2017 report, there were 32 different articles on a variety of topics, and they fell into the seven themes. So when you opened the book or went online, you would start with species and habitat, clean water, sense of place and well-being, coastal development and livelihoods, stewardship and governance, oceanography and climate change, and seafood. 
So a little teaser for those who are interested. In the upcoming 2020 report, we have 34 articles. Six of them are brand new. Now, if you quick at math and listen to what I was saying, 32 plus six doesn't equal 34. Um, but we've had a couple of articles that we were unable to get an update for, one article that wasn't um, suitable for updating, and two articles that we combined into one. So the new articles play a lot about climate change. There's an introduction to climate change. There's a beautiful article about how to bring your community to zero carbon emissions. Um, there's an article about ocean acidification. We managed to get one in there on pinnipeds, which is your seals and sea lions, and a couple of others, including plastics and another pollution one. So as we were moving forward, something we realized was that we wanted to change this icon. Climate change is pervasive and it touches on every aspect of our life and it touches on every theme that we um, are working on. So this orange circle around the outside indicates climate change and it's touching every single one of these triangles. Something else you'll note is that this theme was previously called oceanography and climate change. We flipped that around and called it climate change and oceanography. Um, again, for the reason that climate change is so in your face and it's, it's pervading every part of our life and it needed to be, um, the focus of it needed to be increased. We needed to be really thinking about this the whole way through. So we rearranged the order of these themes. So when you open the new book, you'll get through the front of book stuff, the executive summary, um, the key issues and things. And then you're going to straight away get to climate change and oceanography, and you'll directly read about what is climate change. Another very important change we've done um, in every article we're applied, we've added a new heading, and that heading is how will climate change impact sea stars, uh, eelgrass, whatever, whatever, just to help bring that focus in. I think it's very much at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, but it doesn't hurt to keep it there. Um, <clears throat> you also notice we've changed this middle circle. It was ecosystem health. We've now renamed it community and ecosystem health. Because if you don't have a healthy ecosystem, you're not going to have healthy communities either. And communities are a part of that ecosystem, and it's our job to help protect it. Okay, so here, the next thing we have, um, I'm just going to pause for a second and read these comments. Uh, yes, I can share the access to the interactive version. I'll do that at the end of this talk, if I, if I may. And I'm pleased you love the cover because I do too. Um, so we give um, Ocean Watch rating legends, basically a health rating for each of the articles in the report uh, where it's applicable. Um, and these are more or less, I'd call them a traffic light style rating. Green is good, red is definitely not good. And in the middle, orange is fair to middling. Um, so I'll talk you through these. Green is healthy, and that's according to the available data. There's a positive trend. Um, there is data available. There's actions being taken to improve the health and they're known to be effective. And a big sort of caution warning I want to put around this is that people often see healthy and then think, oh great, we've done our job, now we can step back and go to something else. Actually, we have to keep working and keep taking actions to continue to maintain the health of whatever that topic might be. If we just put it down and leave it, things will go backwards. Portion, the orange in the middle one, it means there's some data available and trends available, but the outcome might be contradictory or we can't tell if it's good or bad. And we need to take more actions and stronger actions to move into a pot of positive status. Critical, uh, the data is indicating that the issue or impact is very high risk and it might result in a very low or vulnerable status. The improvements are minor, uncertain, slow, um, and the actions to address or mitigate them are not existent, vague, or they've got very low effectiveness. Now, the very bottom line here, limited data, not rated. Some of the articles don't have data available, so we can't rate them. And in the 2017 article, there were some articles that it was not appropriate to rate them, um, such as cultural continuity, for example. So the picture in the background here is of eel grass, which you can just see. So I wanted to give you an example. Um, in 2017, the health rating for eelgrass was critical. Okay, so it was the red circle here. Coming up into 2020, 
There's been such a lot of positive action and forward movement, a lot of eelgrass transplants being taken, undertaken by a number of different groups. Um, eelgrass has now improved its rating to caution with an upward arrow. So in the upcoming report, we've added upward arrows to indicate things are moving in the right direction. And there is the option of a downward arrow if things look as though they're sliding backwards. But I'm happy to say nothing actually got a backwards, a downward arrow. So the article structure from 2017, there was a what's happening, why is it important, a First Nations connection, what is the current status and what can you do? For the upcoming 2020 report, we don't actually repeat the why is it important. The reason for why something is important hasn't changed and so we don't want to repeat information and make the report longer than it already is. Um, but what we have done is added that, you know, uh, how will climate change affect this species habitat topic we're looking at right now. If you've looked online and if you're familiar with the report, you'll know that there isn't a First Nations connection given for every single article because in some places it wasn't appropriate or there wasn't information available at the time. So speaking of the First Nations connection, this is a beautiful example that I really like from the Bald Eagles article from 2017. And this particular quote and icon comes from the book where rivers, mountains, and people meet. I'm just, yes, where rivers, mountains, and people meet. From the Squamish Little Watt Cultural Centre, they have allowed us to reproduce this. Um, so bald eagles rely on the marine environment for their survival. They are top predators in the bird world. And they've been a symbolic animal for a number of indigenous groups for, for a very long time. Squamish, or more specifically Brackendale, which is very slightly north out of the town centre of Squamish, um, it's a hot spot for bald eagle populations. If you are into bald eagle watching, definitely go there. Um, and it has been for an extremely long time. So another little teaser of the 2020 upcoming report. Because the First Nation connections to these species and habitats hasn't changed, there's actually far fewer of these connections in the next report. Now, all the previous parts, have culminated into this very, very important section. What can you do? That's why we've put these whole reports together. What can you do? It's a great strength of our Ocean Watch reports that we've taken that knowledge and we've translated it into language that everyone can understand. And we've also produced achievable and understandable action. So you could directly take action and you'd understand why you're doing it. And that's very important. If people don't understand why they're being asked to do something, they won't do it. So I hope um, if you've been wondering in the last few slides as I talk you through the structure of the report, if you've been wondering what this has got to do with healthy oceans, I hope this slide starts to drill down on it. All that background information builds up to this point here, what can you do? So we recognised, of course, that individuals and organisations, um, the actions they can take are very, very different to what local governments, provincial and federal governments can take. So they've been broken out into these two separate sections, individual organisation and government. So the example here, again, comes from Bald Eagles. Uh, maybe as I've been talking, you've been reading some of them, but it's simple things for the individual, such as learning more about eagles, um, using proper viewing ethics when watching eagles, don't disturb them, know the rules around protecting eagles and that it's an offence to possess, take, injure, or destroy a bird's nest or its eggs and so on. At the government level, it was suggestions such as monitoring and managing prey species populations such as chum runs, um, legally recognising important bird areas as protected areas and things like that. So throughout the last report and in the upcoming report, there are a number of key issues that have prevented the health ratings going up for a lot of these. Um, and a lot of these had cross-cutting themes. So when we dug down into it, it was things such as monitoring and baseline data or a lack of funding. A lot of these activities can't happen if there's no funding to support it because you end up relying on people doing it out of their own pocket or of their own time. A loss of habitat, contamination from industry. And again, I'm coming back to it, the governance by 10 different local governing bodies plus Squamish Nation. So from the identification of these key issues and the recommended actions given after every article, an action plan was created to help guide the communities in the sound so they can move forward in a collaborative way. 
So this is the action plan from the 2017 article uh, report. You can see there's seven key actions written there, and, and I can't go back a slide now, I don't think. I, I'm scared I'm going to jump out of my uh, presentation if I do that. But if you see before, there was probably like five or six actions for the individual, four actions for the government level. And if you multiply that by more than 30 articles, you can see it was a very big task to boil this down to just seven key actions. But these key actions were seen as um, important for helping to advance the health of the ocean in the Hell Sound, El Kitsum area. So you can see that there's pop out buttons on the side of that. If you're on the internet, you can pop them out and have a look. So this is an example if you pop out action number one create a marine guide that brings together information about the area at four different um, points below it to follow. It might only be seven key actions to take, but there's so many other actions underneath them and so many steps that need to be taken to achieve them. So it's a really big task. And sort of it brings the question, how do you get momentum and move forward on these actions? So I'm just going to pop in here another teaser for the people who are interested of the 2020 action plan. There are also seven key actions recommended out of the 2020 report. I'm only showing two of them here just because of space. If some of you listening will recall, there was an Ocean Watch workshop in June of last year, and I put everybody to work and cracked the whip and was a terrible taskmaster, and we came up with some amazing work. And some of that work that came out, it was um, talking about what the key issues in the sound are towards advancing the health of the marine environment within the sound. And then people had to vote on those themes that were brought up. So seven themes rose to the top and we completed the 2020 report and we were looking through it and doing that overview. We saw that a lot of these themes that had been pinpointed in the workshop popped up again in the report. So there are the first action is research. The second one is protect and restore. The third is educate and engage. The fourth is regulation. The fifth is funding. The sixth is monitoring. And the seventh is greenhouse gas reductions. Um, so that's really cool that from a workshop, we can see that what the community, the information the community was providing us, it's really, really tied in, completely unplanned, really, really tied into what we've done here. So I finished the previous slide by asking, how do we get the momentum and move forward? Well, we're very lucky to have a group such as these folks. This is a photograph of the Health Sound Community Forum. It's a huge community of motivated people who absolutely love and care for the environment in the area they live. But this is the third time I'm saying it. There are 10 different governing bodies in this area and Squamish Nation. And they all have to take care of their individual communities and people in the best way that they can. And there's no single community there that has responsibility for the waters and the sound. Collaborative, collaborative actions moving forward. Um, they, all of the communities want to protect their local marine environment, but they've got other competing interests that they have to pay attention to and spend their budgets on. It's not just about the marine environment when you're working at that local council level. So Ocean Watch provided them, here's a list of actions. You can take these actions to improve the health of your local environment. And all they had to do, my camera's off, but if you could see me, you'd see me making little quotes around my head. All they had to do was follow this action plan and ta-da, it would be fantastic. Sorry, there's a lot of traffic outside, which is making some noise here. Um, so a subcommittee of this Health Sound Community Forum was created called the Ocean Watch Task Force. And there were representatives from the 10 different governing bodies and Squamish Nation on it. Um, planning, uh, planning staff, people from NGOs. There was Jessica Schultz, who manages the um, Ocean Biodiversity Research Team, sat on it. And when I began this job, I also joined the task force. And one of the key outcomes was the creation of a strategic plan to help guide these local governments in taking collaborative, collaborative, collective steps forward in protecting their marine environment. Basically, it was a how-to to get moving on the recommended actions and to have them all working on complementary actions. You can imagine, you know, 
government A over here thinks this is the biggest priority and works on that and that little area and government B over here thinks actually this is the most priority for their environment and they start working on that and they don't share resources and they don't talk to each other and so they recreate the wheel and they spend money and use up resources that they maybe didn't have to if they were all working together and this is an amazing thing that this community before Ocean Watch came aboard but also since Ocean Watch came aboard has been working together and trying to move everything forward collaboratively and it's a really really key part of success of what they've been doing. So I do want to talk quickly to some of the conservation successes that have come out of this work. Um, there are a lot of very important conservation tools that are developed or still in progress. For example, that Ocean Watch health rating I showed you before, the traffic light, green, orange, red. Um, it was used in the last report and it's being used in the upcoming report as well. And that provides continuity and it's a very easy to understand way to look at the health of what's out there in the sound. Um, there was the creation of the Al Kapsim Health Sound Marine Conservation Map together with the David Suzuki Foundation. That was a big win. Um, there's been an application in, um, in progress to designate Al Kapsim Health Sound as a UNESCO biosphere region that's been spearheaded by um, Ruth Simons and a number of other people. It's a giant application which I think is far fatter than the reports that Ocean Watch has been producing. Um, and that was in progress before Ocean Watch came on the scene, but some of the information from Ocean Watch has been um, used to support that application. Um, the development of the Al Katsim Health Sound Marine Reference Guide. If you recall the action plan from 2017, and I showed in particular action number one, this is the outcome from it. This project, it's still in progress. Um, but it is steaming ahead in leaps and bounds. It's really amazing, pulling together information and um, the wrong word is popping into my head, pulling together those communities as well. It's fantastic. And a number of smaller but just as important conservation wins. I can give you some examples. In the 2017 report, there's an article about Squamish flood planning. When we were doing the update for that article, we discovered that every single action at the government level had actually been done by the Squamish, um, District of Squamish. That's a huge one, that's fantastic. Um, there was a provincial cumulative effects assessment that was conducted. There's ongoing water flow and water quality monitoring going in the, on in the sound. Um, new marine refugia were created around the glass sponge reefs in the sound. Um, there's been a lot of outreach and education using the information from the report. There's ongoing eelgrass transplants happening. There's so many things happening and we're very lucky there's also uh, funding in a bunch of various different places to help support these initiatives to move them forward. So some of you listening might be thinking I'm just a kid, I'm just a student, I, I only go to high school, what can I do? This is all I've seen so far as adults. Well someone forgot to tell this girl that and I think we now all know Greta's name by heart she is a household name whenever you mention climate change and her um, school strike for climate change has gone global, it's huge. So please don't ever underestimate the change that you can bring into effect regardless of your age. On a more local scale, this is a photograph of Trina Ferron, who is a student at ha in Health Sound, or at least she was last year, she may have graduated, I'm not sure exactly of her age. Trina and several other speakers from local schools in Squamish, both high school and elementary, they spoke to the Squamish Council to urge them to ban single-use plastic bags and straws. And the successful outcome has been that single-use plastic bags now come with a fee based on the greenhouse gas emissions associated with their production. And you'd be surprised how many people, if they have to pay five cents, 25 cents, a dollar for a plastic bag, they're gonna screw up their nose and say, no, I'm not paying that. That's fantastic. Um, and plastic straws are now only available if you ask. The reason they weren't outright banned is because there's people with disabilities who still require bendable plastic straws. Um, so that's a really fantastic thing. If you take them out of sight, they're often out of mind and people don't ask for them. So as I wrap up my talk right now, I want to emphasize that anyone and everyone can make a change. Don't think your age or your gender or anything else can limit you. 
just go out there and do it because healthy oceans really do start at home and the people who know those oceans best are the people who live there. So just a very quick thank you to our funders here, the Sitka Foundation, the North Growth Foundation and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation also supported the 2017 report. My email address is at the bottom there if you ever wanted to reach out and ask me any questions. And that's also the website to view the previous reports online, oceanwatch.ca. And I'll leave it there and I'm going to hand it back over to Danica. Thank you everyone for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Aroha. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll really open it up to our audience. Thank you to everyone who's online with us today. And we really do welcome any questions that you have. Um, if you have questions about where to find some of these great resources, you know, we'd be happy to send them your way or direct you to the right place. Or, you know, maybe you want to find out more about what some of the upcoming work and projects might be looking like. So again, feel free to put those in the chat or if you have a specific question, we'd love to see that in the Q&A below so that we can both work on answering everyone's questions. I have put a couple of resources in the chat so far today, including the Ocean Watch link. Definitely, the if you're typing it in, the easy way to go is the oceanwatch.ca. Uh, the full link is in the chat, as well as linking to the interactive version of the map that Aroha was showing at the beginning of her presentation and some of those additional projects coming. So we have a great question coming in here from Susanna to tell us more about the specific citizen science projects, whether they're currently going on or maybe they're coming up in the future. Thank you for that question, Susanna. We've actually got an entire article about citizen science. Um, the citizen scientists in the sound are instrumental in helping us keep our finger on the pulse, if you like, of what's going on. Um, there is Goodness, I'm going to take a guess off the top of my head. There was more than 50 different citizen science groups, um, and we added a lot more. It's everything from bird watching to salmon habitat restoration, um, the Annapolis, the um, ship that was sunk out there to form an artificial reef. People go out and dive and report what they see on the on the boat there. Um, yeah, there's there's just so many so many things. Um, if you want to know right this very second, you can hop onto the Ocean Watch website and click on the Hell Sound report and look for that citizen science article. Um, and then if you want to wait till August, there's going to be a whole update. And there is, it's literally um, yeah, 50 plus different citizen science groups. There's so many different activities that you can get involved in. Um, it's really amazing. Wonderful. And maybe for some folks that are joining us a little bit new, Aroha, could you describe a little bit about what citizen science means and how of people course. Are? Of course. So citizen science, that's often uh, an individual or a group of people who may not necessarily be trained in science or might not be trained in that particular area of, area of science, but they've got a real passion for something. And I keep going back to the bird watching because I know I was using the bald eagle examples here. Um, or it could even be, I was also talking about eelgrass transplant, and you're like, hey, I'm going to volunteer and go and help and do those transplants. And while you're out there, maybe you're taking a record of how many eelgrass plants were moved from one place to another. And then you go back every few months and you measure how much they've grown, how many plants are still there. And that's a type of data that tells you how successful that transplant has been. The bird counts, for example, there's some on Bowen Island, there's some in Squamish, there's some at Lighthouse Park, and it's every month, um, I think every second Sunday of the month, and they'll go out and they have particular areas they look at and they do it at a particular tidal height and they'll record on a sheet what bird species they're seeing and how many in birds they're seeing if they can count that. Um, so that gives you an idea. They're collecting science in a really rigorous scientific way um, and in some cases things like the expansion of this there's an important birding area the English Bay Barad Inlet important bird area which is in the Vancouver area 
And that got expanded in early 2019, about halfway up into Health Sound. The reason that got expanded was because of data collected by citizen scientists who they were going out and they were showing, hey, there's these migratory species and other resident species of bird that live there. And they're not found anywhere else in the world or their numbers have really, really dropped, you know, 90% down from in the 1970s. This is really, really important habitat for them. We need to recognize this. And so it was included in the important bird area. So that's another um, way that citizen science has contributed to really successful outcomes there. Fantastic. Uh, so hopefully we'll see a couple more questions uh, pop in. You're definitely welcome to keep asking. We have about five more minutes or so for today's program, so we'd love to answer a few more. Um, but Rojo, while I have you on the screen, I really loved how you talked about um, Greta and how empowered youth can be. And we do get lots of students of all different ages on the program. And so I was actually wondering if you could share a little bit about what inspired you to get into this role. Um, it's not so much about what inspired me to get into this role. I think it's more about what inspired me with oceans to begin with. Um, growing up in New Zealand, I think there's not very many people who don't grow up somewhere near the coast. And I was one of those people who grew up somewhere near the coast. Um, it was just a short run down the hill to an estuary and beautiful sand covered beaches. Um, so I feel that growing up with the ocean right beside me, that has just become a part of me. Um, so that was kind of my first exposure to it, I guess, as a, as, a, as a small child, my parents have told me that I was constantly, you know, half a kilometer down the beach behind them because I had to pick up every single shell and investigate it and ask them about it. And it must have been very tiresome for them if they were just trying to go for a walk and they had this little child dragging along behind them. Um, but at a very early age, I could name all the common shells and I thought that was normal. It's normal that you can pick them up and name them all right. Everyone can do that. Um, so I think my love and passion for the ocean environment, um, it just started from a young age, from being there. Um, I also really enjoyed working with people. Um, so this particular role, um, the amount of people I've met the enthusiasm and motivation and engagement they have with this work, um, I find that to be equally as motivating and exciting for me as the fact I've grown up and loving the ocean. Wonderful, thank you so much. I can definitely agree that I was lucky enough to grow up on the ocean too, and so that's a, a lot of what kind of got me into working with ocean conservation. And it's so nice to hear that, you know, community sense of connection, no matter where in the world you grew up next. And I did just drop my um, email address again into the chat box on the side in case people wanted that and it wasn't, I've, I've turned off that presentation. So please do feel free if you don't like talking in front of a lot of people, um, feel free to drop me an email um, and I will do my best to answer. Well, thanks so much. Um, and I just put into the chat a link to our youth programs for OceanWise Education, lots of ways to get connected to other youth in the community and find out what kind of programs and initiatives they want to see come forward. And so again, just as Aroha said, there's no you know, age too young to get started on feeling passionate about these things and taking action. So thank you so much. Um, we're just about at time, so I just have a few concluding words for today. And again, if everyone would like to send a big thank you in the chat, uh, we'd love to stay connected and look forward to more opportunities to share updates for the 2020 um, program that's coming out, as well as more work that will be going on. So again, we hope to stay connected with everyone. Um, so as we're just wrapping up today, I have a few notes to share. And share my screen again here. <laughs> I can probably mute myself given I know there's still traffic going on outside here. And um, so thank you again. This was a wonderful uh, presentation today, all about you know ways to connect to community conservation and share what's going on and ways to find out more. 
Next week, our next coming, our next program coming up is Family Ties, Getting to Know the Killer Whales of British Columbia with Sarah Wilson. So we look forward to seeing hopefully many of you back for our June 18th program at 1 p.m. Pacific time and learning a little bit more about some of those local populations here with us. We also have more online opportunities with you. You can check out our resources at ocean.org slash online learning. And we have some live stream programs from our wet lab coming up next week. Uh, so you can check out all of those programs online and hopefully we'll see you in our audiences or we'd love for you to share them with um, teachers and educators and school groups if that is a good fit for them as well. We'll continue the learning. I do want to acknowledge that we uh, that OceanWise is continuing to work towards reflecting on how as a team we might work in allyship towards racial justice and a more equitable society. And so you can visit our Aqua blog to see uh, our CEO Lassa's statement on making sure that we are moving towards that and making space and continued space for all voices in the programs and work that we're doing. And there is a link in that Aqua blog article to Dr. Johnson's article as well. And again, we hope to see you in more of our programs as they continue. And if you have any questions for us after this program concludes, you can always connect with us at education.ocean.org or check us out on Twitter at OceanWiseEDU. Send us any messages or questions that you might have. Um, and you can find out more about our upcoming programs at ocean.org, learn online. We're so excited to share that this week's campaign to fundraise to reopen our marine mammal rescue center was a success. We still have a long way to go, but we kind of made our minimum. Um, and, but OceanWise and the Vancouver Aquarium is still facing quite a few challenges due to COVID-19 and the continued closure of the Vancouver Aquarium. And so we would love for you to share our programs, keep getting the word out. And if you would like to find out more ways to support us and these programs, you can visit vanaqua slash savva slash community so for some great local um, community projects that are really helping keeping um, us here, keeping these programs coming to you and helping us work to reopening. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope to see you next week at 1 p.m. for our next program. So thank you so much. Thank you, Aroha.